It's never too late to build one's inherent grammar, uh, but it is, of course, most easily done at the younger age. Hello, and welcome to the Arts of Language podcast with Andrew Poudois, founder of the Institute for Excellence in Writing, or as many like to say, IEW. My name is Julie Walker, and I'm honored to serve Andrew and IEW as the Director of Marketing. Our goal is to equip teachers and teaching parents with methods and materials which will aid them in training their students to become confident and competent communicators and thinkers. Well, Andrew, happy Grammar Day. Grammar Day? Yes. Today is National Grammar Day. Well, technically, it is today because today is March 4th. We're recording this on March 4th so that we can launch it. Usually, we try to launch it on Wednesday, March. So March 6th is when this is going to come out. But yes, but happy— t- Today is National Grammar Day. Today is National Grammar Day. And I think it's because it's the day of the year that is an imperative— you must march, march 4th. 4th. Oh. Right? Okay, so March 4th, National Grammar Day, March 4th. Let's do it. So I think of your humor talk and how much how much of our language is based on grammar, of course, or grammar is based on language. How which way does that work? But so much humor is based on nuances and different ways to say things. Like puns and double entendres, mm-hmm, sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you you have a lot of embedded humor in your talks because you know grammar. Perhaps that's true. So there you go, kids. Learn grammar so you can, can be, be funny, funny. <laughs> like Mr. Poudois. <laughs> so I thought it would be a good day to talk about grammar in general and Quite frankly, fix it specifically. Fix it, of course, is our grammar curriculum. Right. Well, we we don't want to rehash the whole talk, but 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 what about grammar? People can listen mm-hmm. to that if they wish, right? Right. And we'll put a link to that talk in the show notes. Um, but it is interesting to I think contemplate that the what I would call the divisions of grammar are really very significant in terms of prioritizing and teaching and the best way to teach. So if I may, mm-hmm. I would uh, I would reiterate from that talk that I believe there's inherent grammar and applied grammar and analytical grammar. And oftentimes people don't appreciate the significance of these distinctions mm-hmm. or they make the assumption that one serves the purpose of the other. Okay. So inherent grammar, that's something we talk about continuously with the nurturing competent communicators. It's the rationale behind our linguistic development through poetry memorization program. Mm -hmm. And it's essentially this idea that our primary grammar is learned environmentally. Right. It's learned at a young age. It is absorbed through the environment, through the language that our parents speak to us, through the things we read, uh, through the things that are read to us, through the things we memorize. And that is what builds into our mind the standard of grammar that helps us determine is something right or wrong. Right. Is it correct or not correct? Does it sound good or not sound good? And can I give two real-life examples of the opposites of that? Sure. So my husband was raised in a home where his mother is Japanese. And so a lot of his natural language was broken English. You know, hmm. he his mother did not speak Japanese to him because his father wouldn't allow it. And so she taught him English in her own broken English Mm -hmm. style, right? And to this day, he struggles a little bit with writing, emails, even. Where do I put that comma? Do my subject and verb agree? He never drops an article, which is very common in Japanese language learners. But, And then contrast that with my own upbringing, where both of my parents were well-educated. My dad read out loud to us in great quantities when I was a child. So 
I learned to write by an extension. So I learned a grammar inherently, like you say. Mm -hmm. So what do we do for those English language learners? Like my husband, who is ra being raised in a home that mom or dad Right. Is and of course, you know, the youngest mind, the absorbent mind period, mm -hmm. that's when that inherent grammar is most powerful right. in its effect. Although it doesn't mean that we can't improve our grammar and vocabulary and syntax later in life. Right. I often use the case of Frederick Douglass, uh, who grew up uh, enslaved, mm -hmm. uh, illiterate, in a horrible and abusive situation, and yet he became arguably one of the, if not the greatest American orator of all time. Mm -hmm. How did that happen? And uh, part of what he said was that he memorized speeches from uh, the Colombian Orator, a book of speeches. Uh, so it's never too late mm -hmm. to build one's inherent grammar, uh, but it is, of course, most easily done at the younger age, which right. is why we are so continuously exhorting parents and teachers to read out loud to children in huge quantity and do a program of memorizing beautiful language. Right. So that's the first most. And really, when you think about it, that's that's what we use every day. Mm -hmm. When we read something that we wrote or someone else wrote, we're not analyzing it in a technical way. We read it and we say, we don't even say, we just have this reaction. That sounds good. That sounds right. No, that doesn't sound right. Mm -hmm. We don't necessarily have to have the explanation as to why it doesn't sound right. Right. But it's helpful. Now, in writing, we we do have to kind of move into the area of applied grammar. Mm -hmm. So we we know something is right or wrong when we see it or hear it. But if it's not right, we have to know how to fix it. Mm -hmm. We have to know what needs to be changed. That, I would say, essentially is what you often see on standardized tests or uh, tests like the ACT or the CLEP English is they'll give you a passage and then some, some options as to what fits best into that passage. Or they'll give you a, a, a passage and they'll mark something and, and uh, there will be, you know, is that correct or not correct? So you're, you're really tr kind of using your inherent grammar to notice and then your applied grammar to figure out, okay, which one is the best fit? How mm -hmm. do we fix that and make it correct? This is, of course, the primary skill of editing mm -hmm. as well. And you keep saying fix it, and I can't help but think fix it grammar. Yes. Well, there's a story behind that. Okay. We, we can talk about that. It's a good one. Uh, and then there's the analytical grammar, which mm -hmm. is uh, very technical, uh, where you you know all the parts of speech and all the things in grammar. You know exactly what those things are called, mm -hmm. and you may know and be able to articulate the rules behind their use. Mm -hmm. But that is... Uh, in many cases, a somewhat abstract concept, especially for younger children. And so there's kind of that paradox, which uh, is, you know, good writing has good grammar, but you don't necessarily have to know all that grammar to write well. And that's one of the paradoxes I, I discuss in that talk, but, but, but what about grammar, which I will be doing, by the way, at all of the uh, great homeschool conventions this year. Great. In, uh, Texas, this right like tomorrow, uh, and then uh, South Carolina, Cincinnati, and we also have new ones in Rochester, New York, and in Northern Calif Florida. And oh, in Ontario, California. Yeah. Right. And there's one in St. Charles, Missouri that you're not going to I be I won't at, be there. But we'll be yeah. sending your son to speak. <laughs> yeah. Not not on grammar, but no. on dyslexia. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so so the, the analytical grammar... Um, is something that, you know, it, it, it can kind of go on a long way mm -hmm. as you get into sentence diagramming, you get mm -hmm. into some uh, very obscure terminology that a lot of people kind of heard and forgot what mm -hmm. it meant, like, you know, mitochondria or something, you know, you, you, you 
You That's ha- not a grammar term. No, you have it from <laughs> biology once right. upon a time. But to define it, you might need a dictionary or right. a, a book. Same thing with some of the grammar mm-hmm. uh, elements. And and I point out in that talk, uh, and we'll, we can. I'll just say this, we can drop it for today. But the very best way to learn that analytical grammar is to study a different language, mm-hmm. a foreign language. Because when you're trying to kind of teach a child English grammar and say, this is how you speak English. It's a little bit like saying, I will explain to you how you ride a bike. Kids like, um, dad, I know how to ride a bike. And you say, well, yes, but you don't understand all the biology and physics that make bike riding possible. You have to understand that. The kid's like, well, why? Can I just go ride my bike? We're kind of like that. Why do I have to know that? Can I just talk English? Mm Mm-hmm. (laughs) <laughs> right? Although it's funny how you can grow up saying things that are not quite correct mm-hmm. and not ever notice they're not correct. Mm-hmm. One day I was talking along and I said a whole nother thing. <laughs> a friend who was with me said, that's not correct grammar. I said, what do you mean it's not correct grammar? It's a whole nother thing. Everybody says a whole nother thing. Says, so I think especially if you're from California. Yeah, possibly. Mm-hmm. There's no such thing as a Another. Another. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. That's worse than a split infinitive. That's a split word. <laughs> Let's take the first syllable and stick another word before the second. Uh, so anyway, uh, studying a foreign language, um, preferably Latin, something very organized and inflected, will help you then reach the point where things like gerunds and participles and the passive paraphrastic are all <laughs> comprehensible. Whereas in English, it's it's much harder. But uh, the applied grammar, that's where we, uh, I think we've, we've come up with a remarkable niche product here. Mm-hmm. In fact, people tell me, and I'm sure our customer service people here, this is the best one we've ever found. This, There's nothing like this to teach grammar this easily. Mm-hmm. Yes, it's very popular. I'm sure our listeners will be very interested to hear from you, Andrew. How did this come about? The Fix It, yes. Well, it was a long time ago, long time ago. I was adopting my basic approach to trying to teach at the point of need. You know, Mm -hmm. that's one of Mrs. Ingham's most repeated, most important, wisest observations is when we teach at the point of need, then there's relevancy, there's retention, everything goes better. And when we try to teach something that is not applicable, then it it just kind of goes in one side out the other. Mm-hmm. You know, so with a typical grammar book, you're kind of, you know, going through these things and you hit, you know, chapter 12, you know, um, verbals, participles, gerunds, and infinitives. I, what what's the point of all that, mm-hmm. the, the relevancy? So I came across this little book that had been published some time ago uh, by a teacher uh, called Grammar with a Giggle. Mm-hmm. And, of course, the title grabbed me because mm-hmm. I really appreciate the idea of in- integrating humor in teaching. And uh, so I read this uh, book and I found that it had – Almost what I was trying to come up with, but well articulated, Mm. and that was um, try to take the errors or goofy things that students do in their writing and teach the mini grammar lesson from that. So in my Four Deadly Errors talk, I kind of explain how, you know, I'll mark a paper here, but copy the goofy thing on a notepad and mark, fix the paper here copy on my notes, fix it here, copy it there, give those back with a smile, say, here, implement these changes and you're finished. But over on my notepad, I've got mini grammar lessons, Mm -hmm. which can be applied at the beginning of a class. And so I was kind of doing that. Her idea in this grammar with a giggle was uh, find out what your students need to practice and then create little compositions with these embedded errors. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought, well, that that sounds kind of like fun. So I tried a few and it worked nicely. She suggested that uh, the best way to do this would be to include some of the children in your class 
as characters in these mm. little stories. Mm -hmm. And if you could, you could kind of keep the story going um, and you could uh, create the next chapter, so to speak, the next paper by drawing from what you see the students doing. So if they're mixing up there and there and there, okay, mm -hmm. you could create a little story that would give them practice on that, mm -hmm. uh, fixing it. Mm -hmm. uh, or if they maybe had a, a problem missing commas, then you could create a story where they would be missing a comma that the students knew should definitely be there or right. capitals or, you know, any kind of mechanics. And I think she was an elementary school teacher, so she she did that. And uh, I, I like that idea so much. I not only was doing it with my own students, but I started selling the book. And so I, I put it in our little catalog. I think this is maybe even before you came on board. <laughs> I think so. Yep. Um, because I like to, you know, share new ideas. And, of course, I was always desperate to sell something. <laughs> and uh, there were three. There was Grammar with a Giggle, More Grammar with a Giggle, and The Chortling Bard, which was that same idea only with Shakespeare stories. Right. Well, there were a couple problems with this set of books. Mm -hmm. One of the problems was it required quite a bit of effort on the teacher's part. Mm -hmm. um, even using her canned stories was going to require effort on the teacher's part. And, uh, of course, a lot of my clientele were homeschool moms with many children at many different grade levels and and uh, that's asking a lot, you know, that level of lesson planning and materials preparation. The other thing is, you know, I think she brought in a, a kind of worldly, I'd use the word vulgar only in that it wasn't crude, but it was just kind of low-level pop culture mm. uh, into these stories because, you know, she's writing for her, her audience. Um, and I had a few complaints. People mm -hmm. uh, were not pleased with the contents of a book. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, you know, it's, I mean, who's going to be pleased with everything you ever read in a book? But you know how people are. So I thought, well, what I want is I want one of these only at a higher cultural standard and a little bit different, a little more organized, a little more specific, something that I can just sell to people and they can use it without having to do much in the way of preparation work. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's when I pitched the idea to Pamela White. Yes. And I said, Pamela, I love this grammar with a giggle idea. I don't think it's proprietary. I mean, I was kind of doing it before I came up with this book. Right. I think of the not me stories that you include with the student yeah, intensive yeah, continuation yeah, course. The, yeah. Those were fun. I said, how about it? Could you create one of these? And uh, she did and uh, used... Uh, some some classic mm -hmm. stories. So these were stories that uh, were, were fairy tale like or mm -hmm. had some classic value, and uh, we built this up, and it it sold very well for a long time. In its first edition, it wasn't as age specific. It wasn't. It didn't go past a certain point, and it didn't have quite enough information to make it as easy to use mm -hmm. as I had hoped. But it was a huge improvement over what we had before. So mm -hmm. I just thought, well, you know, that fix it. What a good title. Mm -hmm. And then the subtitle was Grammar and Editing Made Easy with Classics. And then you, uh, as our chief of everything <laughs> pertaining to selling stuff and making people happy and product development and all that, thought we, we could take this to the next level. Yep. And that's what we did. So yep. there's the story of how Fix It came to be. Yep. So we went from the idea of Grammar with a Giggle, three little books that you sold, a couple hundred copies a year, something like that. Yeah, max. Yeah. Math. yeah. To now six levels, six books of Fix It Grammar that has that's being used in our online classes, that's being used in co-ops and schools across the nation, truly. Yeah. And a lot of people are learning English even as their second language or third or whatever language they're on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and finding it to be very helpful, very useful. So yeah. the product is a teacher book. You're actually buying the teacher book. So you as the teacher 
whether you're in a classroom or a parent, are buying the teacher's book that has all the, well, the stories, of course. Well, there's there's this, there's the unedited version Correct. that the children have to fix. Right. And then there's the fixed up version. Right. So the teacher book is the fixed up version. Right. And included in the price of that you get access to the PDF file right. with all the student pages. Right. And so you would just download the student pages and print them off a week at a time and yeah. pass them out to your class? There's, there's different ways to use that mm-hmm. too. Um, you can, if you wish, print them off and hand them to the students one page at a time, which mm-hmm. is probably recommended because you, you don't want them to read ahead in the mm-hmm. story. Right. You want them to look forward to next week's grammar. Yeah, because it's 30 weeks of grammar instruction all built on a story. One story, yeah. Yeah, Robin Hood. You hear at the beginning of the story that Robin Hood encounters little John. Well, what happens next? You won't find out till next week. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. So there is that element. Um but uh, also, some teachers will um, not even give the students the page. They'll mm-hmm. actually uh, copy from the student page mm-hmm. on a whiteboard, mm-hmm. have the students copy that un- copy that unfixed version from the whiteboard, and then try to fix it themselves on their own paper. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've also seen in schools uh, where teachers will uh, put it up on a PowerPoint. Mm-hmm or a projector of sorts, and the students can then copy it. So the basic idea is whether you hand it to them or show it to them and they copy it, they have the the sentence or two for the day with embedded errors. Mm -hmm. There's a little list of what they're looking for. Right. Right. Uh, In addition to that, there's some, uh, I wouldn't say exhaustive, but there's some marking of the parts of speech, Mm -hmm. the dependent clauses, and the stylistic techniques. So while you don't have to use the structure and style writing program in order to do the fix it, if you happen to do them both together, you know, that builds a bridge there. Yes, and each teacher book is only $19. So it's a good good value too. (laughs) And there's six of them. Yeah. So book one, what do we recommend uh, age grade level for the nose tree? So we actually recommend that for any level, depending on how much grammar they've had in the past. Mm-hmm. It's just very basic, gives, lays the foundation that you said main clause, dependent clause, those kind of ideas because those are really helpful in identifying where to put a comma, which is one of those really difficult tasks. Yeah. You start to learn that in nose tree. So we say start our grammar program at fourth grade. If you really have to, maybe third grade, but you don't need it before that. Fourth grade is when we recommend that you start and start with the nose tree. If you have a high school student that has done years and years of grammar but still can't figure out where to put things, they might need to start at nose tree as well. Okay. But we do have a grammar placement test. Uh, oh, we have a placement test. Right. Okay. Um, I know uh, one year I had some students with kind of a very mixed mm-hmm. grammar experience level, and uh, I taught through Robin Hood. Mm-hmm. And I found it a bit irritating because my students would engage me in this conversation about whether Robin Hood was justified or not in some of his actions. (laughs) Was he actually a good person? And do the ends justify the means? And I'm like, guys, you're just trying to distract me so we don't get to the writing assignment. So shut up and do this. You know, I didn't say it quite that no, way, of but you didn't. Um, uh, the story, you know, the story was engaging. But what I noticed was uh, some of the kids had a pretty easy time of it. They they knew most of it, mm-hmm. but it was good practice for them. Yes. And in doing it together, the ones for whom it was new, uh, fortunately, there's this embedded repetition. Mm-hmm. So they kind of keep doing and identifying and marking the same yep. things again and again and again. Yep. The fix it doesn't assume that anybody uh, has learned it and will never forget it. Right. It's <laughs> it's constantly repeating. Mm-hmm. And that's part of the, you know, the brilliance. And that's and it continues on mm-hmm. into six volumes. Yes. With book six being mm, college level, I'm gonna um, say. Yeah, or or post. <laughs> um, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. So um, when we did this, I myself took that story, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, with all the embedded errors, and I just wanted to see, could I fix it? Yes. And it is so tricky. <laughs> I mean, it is profoundly tricky. 
I would guess that a person who successfully completes through book six、mm -hmm. has a graduate level or <laughs> a knowledge of grammar that few English graduate students even have. Right. I mean, it is it is very very、uh, challenging and advanced. But you know what? It's it's a gradual pathway. Yes. It's a mastery learning approach. Yes.、Uh, you don't. You don't jump into book six. You、nope. work up to it gradually, but it's been been kind of fun as I travel around the country and do writing classes, and I've met some teenagers. Yes, who have who are doing or have finished. Yes, all six volumes of Fix It Now. Yes, we sell enough of those to know there are some grammar experts out there that gradually learned it little by little. So yeah, so we actually have a blog post on this topic of Fix It. And we do this every now and then. They're called product spotlights.、Mm -hmm. And whenever we do a product spotlight, we take some time to introduce the reader of our blog to the product, how to use it, and then at the end of that blog post is a way that they can enter a contest to win a copy of the product that we've talked about. So,、oh. we will invite you to go to iew.com/blogs. With an S, and you should be able to find this grammar post. Now, this does expire at the end of March because this is National Grammar Month.、Okay. Oh, oh, it's not just Grammar Day; it's Grammar Month. Yes, yes, we get a whole month to talk about grammar, but today was the best day to talk about it because it's the fourth.、Right? Okay, well, I'm I'm grateful to hear that, and、um, if I recall correctly, we also do have、uh, a a webinar recorded. That's right by the author. Pamela White、mm -hmm. on how to use Fix It.、Uh, so, if in reading the instructions you still have any confusion,、um, the student books contain our grammar glossary, glossary, which、mm -hmm. is, I don't know, possibly one of the best things out there. Maybe we should, <laughs> you know, publish that separately. And well, we do include that with. For our premium members, they have that in their files. Oh, they can. So、okay. all premium members have the grammar glossary in their files. So yeah, just a tremendous resource, kind of a handy, almost like a a guidebook. And you know, people when when they walk up and talk to me,、mm -hmm. generally have positive things to say. I mean, there's not a lot of people walk up and say, "Hey, you I bought your、yeah. such and such, and I hate it."、Um, <laughs> I mean, once in a while, but honestly, I. I cannot think of any time I have ever heard anyone mention fix it, and I would say, "Well, how's it going?"、They、say,、mm -hmm. "Oh, we love it.、Mm -hmm. It's it's great. It makes、mm -hmm. it so much easier."、Mm -hmm. uh, we've had students、yes. say that to、mm -hmm. us. You know,、mm -hmm. kids actually say, "This is so much better than what I used to do."、Mm -hmm. um, so let's encourage everyone to give it a try if they、yep. haven't. And of course, we ha if if you do hate it, just send it back. We've got our hundred percent unconditional, no time limit, money back guarantee. So.、Do. I'm very excited about where we're going with Fix It, and I think that、uh, we'll see continued opportunity to bring this into、um, public schools, private schools,、yeah. charter schools. I know one lady even uses this in a prison,、yes. uh, prison context.、Mm -hmm. So it's a it's a great work, and we're very thankful to、uh, all the team that put this together. Yes, and so we're. We're helping people learn grammar without having to become grammar police, right? We're just helping them learn it without being critical of each other. It's a fun way to do it. Yeah, and I still have my shirt that says <laughs> "Let's eat, Grandpa," and then on the back it says "Let's eat, comma Grandpa," <laughs> and then below that it says. Commas save lives. Yes, they do. <laughs> A present from my four-year-old grandson. Oh. oh, so sweet. That's great. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much for joining us. If you enjoyed this episode and want to hear more, you can subscribe to this podcast in iTunes, Google Play, or Stitcher, or just visit us each week at iew.com/podcasts. Until then, on behalf of Andrew Pudwa and the team at IEW, I thank you for the privilege of allowing us to partner with you on your journey toward better listening, speaking, reading, writing, and thinking. Thank you.